to the leading international seminar on law and institutions for economic development, theory and practice from India, organized by the Inter University Center for Alternative Economics, Department of Economics, University of Kerala. First of all, I would like to welcome all our distinguished dignitaries over to the dais. Dr. N. Miramanikandan, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor of University of Kerala, who is chairing the session. Professor B.S. Chimney, who is our keynote speaker of the day. Professor A. Abdul Salim, Dr. M. J. Prakash. We live in a world of asymmetric information where uncertainty and risks are given, are given reality. And this leads to externalities, externality costs and social costs, which is greater than individual costs or benefits. This is where the role of the third party becomes a necessity to reduce these risks in the process of production and exchange. The proposed seminar focuses on the role of both legal and extra-legal institutions as well as social norms which facilitate economic activities and its subsequent contribution to economic development. So without wasting any more time, let us move towards the inaugural session of the seminar. Let us all stand up for a silent prayer after which we will begin the inaugural session. Chancellor of Kerala University, Dr. N. Veera Manikandan, is the chair of this session. For all the endeavors of IOCA since its inception, he has given us immense support and encouragement. We are really thankful to have you, sir, as the honorable chair of this session. We welcome you to this session. For the welcome address, may I invite Professor A. Abdul Salim, honorary director of IOCA, and also our beloved head, Department of Economics, University of Kerala, who is the catalyst behind the formation of this center and the main source of energy behind all its activities. Sir, I welcome you for the A warm good morning to one and all. Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, Dr. M. Deera Manikanda, respected registrar of the university, Dr. M. J. Prakash, respected professors and delegates, my dear colleagues, research scholars, and students. This is the third international event we are organizing under the Indian University Center for Studies in Alternative Economics. We started our activities 18 months ago. The basic objective of this center is to promote research and innovative studies with the aim of addressing the basic problems of the economy and the society. And you know the neoclassical stream, the role played by the neoclassical stream in addressing the problems and the necessity of the alternative stream in comprehensively addressing the basic problems of the economy and society. With this object in mind, for the last 18 months, we have been undertaking uh, several academic events in the, in the focus areas of research like institutional economics, neuroeconomics, green economics, etc. And this event is also one of the premier events uh, which is going to be perhaps the first one we are, which is going to be organized uh, in the history of Kerala uh, based on this specific theme. Uh, as you know, we, we have been undertaking three important activities. The first one is offering internships, associateships and projects to the researchers who want to undertake research in the focus areas. The internships are given to the postgraduate and eventual students. The associateships and projects are offered to teachers uh, like young professors of various universities and colleges working in Kerala and outside. Then we organize national and international seminars, conferences, also workshops and lectures under the banner of the Indian University Center. Finally, we undertake the publication of the research outputs received in the center as part of internships, associateships, projects, etc. Now, in this function, we are going to release some of these uh, outputs which have come out, come out after 
uh, first editing of the sale. See, uh, I'm not going into the details of the today's event because our uh, seminar coordinator, Mr. Siddiq, has to do this and he is on the way because of some of his personal problems he could not reach earlier. Anyway, he is uh, on the way and he is going to come within a uh, few minutes. Uh, so, uh, he will introduce the theme of this today's event. My responsibility is to offer welcome to one and all present here. Uh, friends, we are all familiar to the Pro Vice Chancellor of this university, Dr. Ian Veeramani uh, I am very happy to remind you that he is, one, he is the chairman of the Executive Council of the Indian University Center. The, uh, the council, the executive council has eight members, two from the outside state and eight from uh, the Kerala and the chairman is the pro vice chancellor. See, I used to have frequent visits to discuss various aspects of the activities of the Indian University Center. And I found him very friendly and highly genuine in promoting the programs of the center. Uh, and you know, he is a very popular uh, pro vice chancellor among the students and staff. On behalf of the university and also on behalf of the center and on, uh, on, on behalf of all of us, I extend you a hearty welcome to you, sir. <laughs> Today, we are really privileged of having Professor Bhubindra Singh Shivini for the inauguration of this seminar. He is a renowned professor at the Center for International Legal Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. His area of specialization is international law. Earlier, he was Vice Chancellor, West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences during the period 2004-07. He was also a member of the Governing Council of Indian Council of Social Science Research. He is a well-known writer on various issues in law and economics. Sir, on behalf of all of us, and on behalf of the University of Kerala, I extend you a hearty welcome. Our Registrar, Dr. M. J. Prakash, is here to felicitate this function. He is very close to us. In fact, he was a student of the Department of Economics. Uh, he did his PhD under Dr. P. Uh, uh, under uh, uh, Ramach Ramachandran Nayar, sir. He has been highly helpful to all our academic activities of both the center and also the Department of Economics. Sir, I extend you a warm welcome. Eminent experts from the reputed universities and institutes are present here as our special invitees. Professor Jaivir Singh of the Center for the Study of Law and Governance, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Professor Sadish Kumar Jain of the Center for Economic Studies and Planning, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Professor Ram Singh of Delhi School of Economics. On behalf of all of us present here and on behalf of the University of Kerala, I extend a hearty welcome to all of them. We are really privileged of uh, welcoming Dr. R. Vijay, uh, uh, who is coming within a few minutes uh, on the way. Professor, he is the professor of the University of uh, Hyderabad uh, and I am happy to remind you that he is one of the two external experts of the Indian University Center. Uh, today in the evening we are going to have an executive council meeting uh, in his presence. I extend a hearty welcome to Professor R. Vijay. I also welcome all other resource persons and delegates who have come here and also on the way. I also welcome my colleagues, Dr. A.K. Prasad, Dr. Manju S. Nair, Dr. Anita, and Mr. Siddiq, who is the coordinator of, the, of this particular uh, event. In fact, Mr. Siddiq has been working day and night to make this event a grand success in spite of his personal uh, engagements, etc. Okay. Uh, special welcome and also th special thanks to you for uh, in initiating all these things. I will never forget the role of my students, research colleagues and the staff, particularly the technical staff of the Indian University Center. On behalf of all of us present here, I extend a hearty welcome to my colleagues and the staff and technical staff of uh, the Department of Economics and the Center. And 
Uh, I, I, I also welcome all the other persons who are uh, professors of uh, different departments uh, of the university and outside. Uh, very important resource persons are here. Uh, say, uh, 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 for paucity of time, I don't want to uh, say much about them. Uh, in, in due course, by presenting their, by making their presentations, uh, they will be duly introduced. And Bismi Govalakrishnan is already here uh, representing one department as a whole. His, uh, her students are also here. I extend them a welcome to you. And see, one more request I have to make. See, um, being the organizing secretary of this particular program, in, in fact, it is a special request. The total allocation for uh, this particular event is nearly 3 lakh rupees. And we expect 100 effective participants divided, uh, divided the, uh, by these 100 participants. We are going to spend nearly 3,000 rupees per head. Hence, I request you to effectively participate in all the activities by contributing uh, to discussions and also disseminating the ideas that you are going to have from uh, these three days events. Uh, that is a special request and actively participate in all the events and all presentations, contribute to the discussions. Thank you. Now, uh, sir. Thank you, sir. May I now invite Dr. N. Veeraman Kandan, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor and Chair of the event, to address the audience. Thank you, Dr. Rafi Sadeem. Professor B.S. Chimney, the Chief Guest of this session. Registrar, Kerala University, Dr. J. M. J. Prakash, Dr. Abdul, Sa Abdul Sali, the Honorary Director, IUCA and Health Department of Economics, Siddhi Rabiat, and other dignitaries of the dais, faculty members, professors, research scholars, and my dear students. Of course, it gives me immense pleasure to be part of this three-day international seminar, which is going to be held on the auspicious of Indore University Center for Alternative Economics. So Dr. Abdul Salim has rightly pointed out the functioning of this the University Center for the last 18 months. But I was also happy how this center is functioning. As we all know that what the university is supposed to do, what is to be given to our students and what is to be given to our fellow teachers. And in that aspect, this center is fully success in its endeavor. We have rightly pointed out there are three international seminars. This is the third one we are supposed to organize. And all these seminars, many of these dignitaries in the field, they have participated. And there are, there are people nationally and internationally reputed people who came over here they have discussions, deliberations, and what is happening in the economy, or particularly the world economy, and also in the Indian economy. So I'm not a person to talk about the economic aspects and its development, and I'm very poor in managing economy. That is also, as far as I am concerned, I'm a poor uh, the economic manager. I proceed. I know that how it is functioning, how uh, the functions of the departments, how it is related to the development, national economic development, how the development, so we all know that India is uh, being a developing, uh, a developing country, our economic has a stability. So there are many factors to maintain this stable economic growth. So definitely, uh, this kind of seminars that gives a lot of information to the young scholars who is in the field of 
economics and also do to understand the, the growth and development of India and other countries. And they can also get opportunity to compare where the deficiencies, where we have to improve that all aspect and how it exists. That all aspect, I think that will be deliberated here. And of course, I hope that uh, people will be, and particularly the students will be most benefited. So they are getting opportunity to present papers also. They are getting opportunity to hear people from various part of the country as well as world. So I hope that definitely this seminar will be a grand success and I wish all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. A very dynamic and creative personality, it is his untimely efforts that made this international seminar a reality. I invite Mr. Siddiq Rabir, the coordinator of the seminar and also assistant professor department of economics to give us a brief idea about what the seminar is all about. Good morning to all. Um, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, Registrar, Professor B. S. Chimney, uh, Selim, uh, Dr. Selim, Javir Sir, Satir Sir, so, and many of my friends, in fact, all of you are gathered here. In fact, this is a very heavy day for me, so let me begin with that. So. I mean, in, in the midst of all the organization, in the night yesterday, I landed up, my <laughs> wife got um, the uh, pain and uh, at the midnight, 2.30, I crashed out of the medical college. So, uh, I was there in the um, SAG till 9.30 and uh, now, then I drive back, back to this program, in fact. So, but with all my joy, actually, I have a good news. Right now, I got a good news that she delivered uh, a baby girl. That is the most important thing. I mean, of course, the seminar. I mean, this is one of the... <laughs> it's a very interesting thing because I was organizing the seminar for the last uh, maybe more than one month. A continuous effort were put up. And uh, the first day, so this is going to be the most memorable day. In fact, I have so this is the third seminar in a consecutive row which I'm uh, organizing international seminar. So this is a great uh, joy, joyful day. In fact, so I would like to share this uh, joy with all of you, and that is the first thing I would like to share. And let me now coming to my duty that uh, to speak about the theme. In fact, so. Uh, the, uh, as, as the introduction, uh, the honorary director, uh, Dr. Amtu Salim, had, you know, maybe spoke about uh, the center, its objective, and uh, what we are striving, and etc. Uh, in fact, uh, what does actually this uh, very topic, law and economics, when came into our mind? We had some discussion in our um, executive committee meeting one year back. So we we were actually having a doubt that whether we can have again a uh, law and economic seminar in Kerala. So that is the first question which everyone started asking. Because whether we are going to get uh, enough uh, resource person in the field, because it is you are trying to put two different disciplines which they normally never come in, you know, power with. They, a lawyer is always say we are great and an economists always say we are great. So, now, law and economics means you know you are trying to make some bridge between this interdisciplinarity. So, in that context, uh, law and economics in different sense because most of the law and economics people think that only neoclassical line. So, there are other stream of neoclassical, uh, non-neoclassical stream also there in the law and economics, law and development literature, for example. So, all these things in my mind, and in fact, all this is where. Uh, Gushing and uh, where I have to put myself is the big question when we started thinking about this. When we broaden the title line, we put it as a law and institution in order to get more people because institution is much broader area where people do work in different parts of the country. So that is why the idea of law and institution came into as the broader theme of the program and uh, 
we again i mean i keep on uh, you know pondering asking people to contribute and uh, luckily i mean most of the other the, the important people who are going to speak today all of them agreed very gladly that is the that is maybe an honor in fact and uh, and uh, somebody who can actually get uh, in the academics so professor jain is very glad to accept because we have in, in the midst, midst of all his ill health and uh, now uh, last couple of months only he started traveling before that is completely lent so the same the case with the professor um, chimney and many more i mean jaiveer sir and uh, vijay sir so all of them in fact operated and now i found that at least a couple of speakers are ensured in every session ram singh and uh, one year back he actually acknowledged this uh, you know uh, this is how actually i try to materialize uh, this very topic itself so then i have a confidence that okay at least we can have the main speaker then we can get definitely the other people also and in fact uh, i i'm i am very privileged to say that a couple of very good papers we got in the in the seminar so i hope all of you are going to enjoy uh, uh, sai ram but is also very very glad i mean he he, uh, he accepted so this is actually the uh, in the outset i would like to speak about the conference but what is actually law and economics conference we mean is the interaction i have already mentioned the interaction between the le legal as well as the economic aspect in the developmental sphere of whatever uh, whether it is an economic development or uh, whatever uh, uh, things which we are aspiring to so in that realm how institution play a very important role uh, to shape uh, uh, the very concept of development that is point number 1 uh, two is actually uh, the concept of efficiency which we can in fact apply very rightly to different aspects where including for example the performance of court how do we i mean of course people can say that okay justice uh, if you actually hurry it then justice buried but still you uh, many people started from uh, to, i mean the early 2000s to start speaking about you know the importance of disposal so disposal of cases speedy disposal because we have more than 3.5 crores of cases pending in the country which is older more than 2 years so that is the rough state i mean uh, uh, the figures which we have so this is actually the context where uh, efficiency and whether it is actually this way of uh, disposing cases good or not this is came into the law and economics literature so you are trying to apply efficiency again in the case of contract why you try to you know uh, uh, stress upon uh, efficiency and parameters to understand the uh, very idea of contract the property also we are trying to formalize and there are other aspects also many economic ideas in fact completely influenced but you know, normally we used to say that you know two party bargaining you need not to have any institution but that is not true in the real world in real world every two party transaction is actually guided by either a social norm or a legal norm so that is legal rule or by social norm so in that sense you know there is a mutual uh, give and take in this discipline itself that is law can contribute a lot to economics and economics can contribute a lot to understand different dynamics of uh, the social performance or the institutional performance for the uh, larger well being of development or, or what we call development so in that context i am tra trying to put the entire seminar and that is actually the rough theme which we have in that we have a uh, different questions including uh, the ideas of douglas not which is going to be discussed by professor chimney in the first session itself so i hope uh, all of you will be enjoying the sessions uh, and uh, maybe by contributing into this particular subject uh, and we we all may get enriched so i would wish a very uh, a very hearty you know uh, and joyous three day ahead thank you thank you congratulations on the good news and thank you sir for the wonderful presentation we are truly honored to have such a distinguished person as our keynote speaker of the day professor upinder singh chimney who is currently the professor at the center for international legal studies jnu he was former vice chancellor of west bengal national university of juridical sciences and is currently a member of the gandhi council of indian council of social science research 
He has authored many books and his areas of interest include international legal theory, international economic and refugee law. It is my pleasure to invite you, sir, for the keynote address on the topic the relationship between law and development, mapping the theory. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, for distinguished professors in the dais and in the audience, and fellow students. Uh, at the outset, I would like to sort of congratulate the Department of Economics here for organizing this uh, conference uh, on law and development. Uh, or legal institutions and economic development. Uh, I can't remember the last time that I've been to such a conference in any law school. I'm not certain about the departments of economics uh, uh, across the country, uh, but I can't remember any other occasion of having to address this issue uh, in a law school. What I'll try and do in my sort of brief address is to address the theme of the conference, which is Law and Institutions for Economic Development. What I'll address centrally is the question whether the quality of legal institutions that Siddiq was referring to matter in promoting economic development, whether effective and efficient law and legal institutions matter in promoting economic development. Now, that at the outset raises two questions. First is, do institutions matter? So legal institutions are simply one kind of institutions. As we know, there are political institutions like the state, there are cultural institutions, and there are other kinds of social institutions in society. Do these institutions matter at all in the context of promoting economic development. Okay. Now, the answer to this question has been, in recent decades, yes. The whole idea that institutions matter is deeply associated with two names who are both Nobel laureates. One is Ronald Coase, who won a Nobel Prize in 1991. And in more popular sort of imagination, associated deeply with the work of W.C. North, who won the Nobel Prize in, 1990, in 1993. Uh, now, both of them answer the question in the affirmative, that institutions matter. What W.C. North suggests is that neoclassical economics, focused as it is on narrow questions of rationality, preferences, and utility maximization, has historically ignored to look at the role that institutions play in society in terms of promoting developments. And he then goes on to argue that Western advanced capitalist countries are where they are because they got their institutions right over the history of, of course, several, over the history of several <laughs> revolutions, uh, several centuries especially after the bourgeois revolutions took place in Europe, uh, beginning with the 1688 Glorious Revolution. Now his argument is that unless you get these institutions right, you will not be able to promote development. Uh, we must remember here when he uses the word institutions, he uses it in a very broad sense of the term. And this is the sort of sentence uh, that I want to cite from his work, which he commonly uh, uh, uses in most of his essays. So by institution, he means humanly divide constraints that structure political, economic, and social interaction. That is, humanly devise constraints that structure political, economic, and social action. And he argues that these institutions, which consists of formal constraints or formal rules, and informal rules have been critical huh, to the development project in, in the West, which includes Western Europe as well as North America. And therefore, he suggests that the developing countries will not be able to make progress, or the post-colonial nations will not be able to make progress 
unless they are able to put together the right kind of social, economic, and political, social, political, and uh, economic uh, institutions. Uh, his argument resembles something very similar. It is very has family resemblance to the kind of argument that the John Rawls makes with regard to the theory of justice. John Rawls also argues that the United States or America or North America has just got it right with its institutions. Because it got political and cultural institutions right, that is why it was able to cre create a welfare state. Not only promote development, but also promote inclusive development. And I think th th there's a, an internal logic, both to the Rawlsian argument as well as to the argument that, uh, that North is, uh, that North is uh, um, uh, making. It's very interesting that uh, Douglas North uh, of, uh, was, in his early years, even as a faculty member, a self-proclaimed Marxist. Uh, and he has written very powerfully uh, in his early work about the contribution of Marxism to the understanding of, uh, to the understanding of uh, institutions. For example, in his, uh, since there are a lot of students, I want to sort of uh, uh, cited for them. So in his early work in 81 on, uh, on, on, uh, on economics of uh, change, he writes, and I quote, the Marxian framework is the most powerful of the existing statements of secular change precisely because it, all, it includes all of the elements left out of the neoclassical framework, left out of the neoclassical framework, institutions, property rights, the state and ideology. And North draws all these elements into his work on institutions. But he then, and as I'll argue, uh, in some ways, empties out this gesture towards Mark by leaving out of his uh, borrowings some of the central features of Marx's understanding of capitalism. Uh, and is a subject that I want to, I want to presently address. But I wanted to emphasize that uh, North borrowed uh, a lot from Marx, but he used this uh, his understanding of institutions in order to complement, as he said, neoclassical theory. So he was not suggesting an alternative to neoclassical theory, but he said neoclassical theory simply doesn't address the world of institutions, and so he wanted to uh, draw in these institutions and then enrich, enrich neoclassical theory. And as I said, I'll argue that that uh, hasn't yielded the kind of insights I, I would have imagined, uh, I would have imagined uh, that it would, uh, it, it would yield. Now, why do institutions matter? Uh, uh, I won't go into this, but uh, the, the, uh, what Douglas North does in his writings and others dealing with institutional economics, repeat ad nauseum, at least for a lawyer, is that it reduces transaction costs and production costs. So the whole emphasis is on the reduction of transaction costs. And as I quote through the literature, I found, and Jay will confirm this for me in the morning, that there's no agreement uh, on what are transaction costs. So there is an inclusive definition of what is in transaction cost, and there are then some constrained definitions of what are, trans uh, what, what are transaction uh, uh, costs. But the essence of the idea seems to be uh, that you must have institutions in place uh, which ensure uh, that, uh, uh, that contractual arrangements and property rights are, uh, 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 are facilitated and enforced. And that if in any in any society which needs to evolve and develop, contractual arrangements and property rights are not given their due by all the social, political, and legal institutions, then the transaction costs would rise and would reduce productivity and also reduce innovation, uh, would also reduce innov innovation, uh, uh, in innovation in, that, uh, in that society. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll try and make out a case against North uh, in order to bring out what I think is distinctive about 
the Marxist perspective uh, on institutions, especially in the context of post-colonial nations. So my argument is that even if you get the institutions right, that even if you have the most appropriate, as if it were, uh, legal, social, and political institutions, you would still not be able to replicate what happened in Northern Europe or in the, uh, or in the United States because of the peculiar combination of uh, uh, the combination of uh, combination of uh, combination of uh, circumstances uh, that prevailed here and that prevailed in Western Europe and North America for them to have achieved the kind of uh, outcomes uh, uh, achieved the kind of outcomes that uh, that they did. But before that, I just want to say a word or two on legal institutions. So, what are legal institutions? Again, uh, if you follow Douglas North's work then he uses this phrase uh, whenever he does, because he normally uh, uses only the word institutions. But when he defines institutions, uh, including legal institutions, he includes within it both informal and formal rules. Uh, so in the case of legal institution, that would informal rules would include things like customary international law, and formal rules would in include something like the constitution, as well as other formal legislations. So it is a combination of these that constitute the rules which inform the working of legal institutions. And these are then accompanied by what one can say organizational infrastructure, such as the courts uh, and the tribunals and other enforcement agen agencies. And together, these rules and this organizational structure with certain technical capacities, which constitute which constitute legal uh, legal institutions. Now, the legal institutions are very very important because, as we know, the idea of rule of law is very important. That uh, the argument is that unless rules are impartially interpreted, applied, and enforced, it is difficult to. Re uh, uh, introduce an element of certainty uh, into the institutional framework, into uh, the sphere of the mar uh, markets. And if this is absent, then according to him, the transaction cost, uh, transaction cost would be, uh, 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 transaction cost would be, uh, uh, would, would be uh, much more than desired. Now let me turn to my argument uh, as to why the North thesis uh, on the importance of institutions, uh, drawing from Marx as he did, uh, leaves uh, a gaping hole, uh, a gaping hole in the whole understanding of uh, in the whole understanding of the working of institutions. So my argument would be threefold, as against this view that institutions matter. And this is respect to, I'm making this argument with respect to the situation in post-colonial nations like <laughs> India and other, uh, other such countries. So my argument number one would be that in borrowing from Marx, he leaves out the central features of the understanding of capitalism that Marx advances. Uh, and by leaving these out of uh, view, while he's able to explain the development in some senses uh, in the Western world, in Western societies, it would completely fail. So when it came to when it came to post-colonial, uh, when it came to post-colonial nations, even in the case of Western societies, my suggestion would be that they were able to build welfare societies uh, because. They could rely on the gains uh, or from imperialism. That is, over five centuries, the exploitation of the colonies allowed them to eventually build welfare states. And that continues to be the basis on which, uh, to the extent they are, uh, they are being dismantled, to the extent they are, that some kind of an inclusive society is, uh, is, uh, uh, has been built in the West. And finally, I would uh, suggest uh, that the nature of imperialism today, uh, 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 especially as uh, in terms of the rules codi codified 
in international law uh, do not allow post-colonial nations the kind of space that they require uh, to promote inclusive, to promote inclusive, uh, promote inclusive development. Let me begin with the first sort of line of argument, which is that North borrows from Marx when it comes to thinking about institutions like the state, think, thinking about ideology, thinking about property rights. What he does is that he, he offers an ad advance in understanding of capitalism, which diverges sharply from that of Marx. Now, familiar with Marx's writings, uh, would know that for Marx, the central feature of capitalism was twofold. And this has been the, uh, you know, allow me to actually, again for students, cite a paragraph here from the writings of Maurice Dobb, who I think was one of the most uh, shrewd uh, and astute uh, students of Marx. And this is what, this is what uh, Maurice Dobb says, is what capitalism is. So he defined capitalism first negatively, not simply as a system of production for the market. That is, he, the Morris Dobb is suggesting that normally capitalism, when it is defined by bourgeois economists, is always defined as production for the market. This is the definition you will find in Milton Friedman's work. This is the definition which is implicit in North's work. But he says that is not what capitalism is, so far as Marx is concerned. So what are the two features that he singles out? So he singles out two features. So he says the differentia specifica, so far as Marx is concerned, uh, which captures the sense of capitalism is when labor power itself becomes a commodity. That's the central feature of capitalism. That is then a worker has nothing else to sell other than his labor power. And then Dobb goes on to suggest that its historical prerequisite, that the historical prerequisite of labor power itself becoming a commodity is the concentration of ownership of the means of production in the hands of a class consisting of only a minor section of society and the consequent emergence of a property-less class. That is, before this can happen, that labor power itself becomes a commodity. It must be preceded by the fact that the society is already divided into these two large classes. One class which owns the means of production and another class uh, which is propertyless, which has nothing else to sell but its labor power. And I think very often I find, even if I may say so, economists not refer to the central feature that informs Marx's writings. Now, why are these two? Uh, why are these two important? Because I think these two features bring out centrally the importance of contracts and property rights to capitalism itself. But they go much more deeper. The importance of contracts goes much more deeper than it goes in the writings of people, in scholars like North or other bourgeois economists. So when bourgeois economists talk about contracts and we needing institutions to ensure that contractual arrangements are conformed to, they conflate all kinds of contracts. They club together every kind of contract, an employer's contract, a teacher's contract, a contract in the market for purchase and sale of goods, as well as that contract between the worker and the capitalist. All these are conflated together into one class of contract. What Marx is suggesting is that actually it is the, since the defining feature of capitalism is that labor power itself becomes a commodity, it is that contract between the worker and the capitalist. And the worker has to be interpreted to assume myriad of forms. So in a sense, we are all workers. Uh, uh, so what Marx is suggesting is that when you talk about contracts and the emergence of contractual arrangements as being central to capitalist societies, it is primarily because of this fact that labor power itself becomes a commodity. And that if you forget this fact and conflate all social arrangements, then you would reach a conclusion that you simply need 
you simply need some kinds of institutions in order to promote development. In other words, what Marx is doing is, while he's talking about the importance of institution, is also simultaneously talking about the structure limits of how far institutions can promote development. Because the structure limits are defined by the fact that a minority of the section of the society own the means of production. And this you cannot transcend, this you cannot override simply by the fact of getting institutions right or getting property rights uh, enforced in law uh, because it is the nature of the property rights which is very, very significant, which is very, very significant uh, in, uh, in terms of the kind of development you can promote, uh, promote in society. In other words, uh, if there are, if the latest report says that the top richest persons in the world have more income than half the population of the world. Uh, Rockspan suggests this in a report that the richest 10 people in the world own more than half, you know, have income more than half the population of the world. Then whatever you do in terms of getting institutions right, whatever you do in terms of getting institutions right, it is not going to be able to transform the structural constraints which are imposed by capitalism itself. The fact that some minority owns the means of production and the others, uh, by and large, have nothing but their labor power to sell. And true, in capitalism, they more meet, meet, as they say, as equals in the market. But as Marx said, between equal rights, always force decides. That is, the worker has no other option but to sell his or her uh, his, his or her uh, labor power. Now, this may seem a very abstract uh, uh, point to make uh, as to what uh, Marx meant by, meant by capitalism, but I feel that to be forgetful of this and to be focused on getting institutions right, uh, and like I said, institutions means cultural institutions, religious institutions, remember? They were thesis of Max Weber on the Protestant ethic and, the, and capitalism. So you have to get all these institutions right. Will not allow you to overcome these constraints which are posed by capitalism as a mode of production. Uh, now this doesn't mean I'm suggesting in any way that institutions should not be improved upon, should not be reformed, or institutions do not matter. No, institutions greatly matter. Uh, if institutions are not right, they can cause uh, serious obstacles in the development pro uh, in the development process. So even within the constraints that we have in society, uh, in a capitalist society, we must try and get institutions right. All I'm suggesting is that this idea that not suggests that all you have to do is get institutions right. Of course, this is a complicated argument. He believes that in developing countries, even if you get instit formal institutions right, the cultural beliefs systems are such that they don't allow uh, 